My name is Lenore von Stein, and this is another episode of The Facts. Uh, tonight, this is a discussion episode. You know, The Facts is, well, some of you know anyway, The Facts is music, stories, and discussions with some very interesting people. And one of them is here tonight, uh, Pauline Park, who is the, the, among her many things that she's been doing, she's the president of the board of directors of the Queen's Pride House, the chair of Niagara, New York. Association for Gender Rights Advocacy. Here we go. And a co-founding member of a New York City uh, Queers Against Apartheid, it's Israeli apartheid, that's the apartheid of the day. Uh, and she led uh, a campaign in, for New York City transgender law, the inaction of transgender rights law, which happened and was enacted in 2002. Whew. Okay, so this, this series of discussions is about um, how money moves around, uh, which it, 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 it's eluded me for most of my life, and so I'm really very interested in this. And it's, it seems to be so important to how how the world works. And and one of, we're going to talk about a few, many different things, but one of them let's let's start off by talking about Israel Israel and Palestine conflict and um, Palestine, the, the economics of Palestine. You were telling me something earlier about that. Well, the situation in the illegally occupied West Bank and East Jerusalem is getting worse every day. Uh, this has been uh, a 50-year-long occupation since 1967. But after the Second Intifada, the Israeli government decided to exclude Palestinians from the West Bank and East Jerusalem from working in Israel. And that has had a devastating impact on the local economy. Employment, uh, unemployment rates have skyrocketed, and instead they've brought in guest workers, they've brought in foreign workers, mainly from Asia, particularly Filipinos, Thais, Indians, etc. Um, and uh, at the same time, with the vast expansion of the settlements under Barack Obama, which is increasing now under Donald Trump, uh, the settlements are basically strangling the local Palestinian economy of the West Bank. Uh, the settlements now control 80% of the water reserves in the West Bank, and water is absolutely crucial for an agricultural economy, which is what the local Palestinian economy is. Uh, the situation in the Gaza Strip is even worse, where Israel is pursuing a policy of incremental genocide, where nearly 90% of the drinking water sources are poisoned, where the Israeli government has basically prohibited reconstruction, uh, since the genocide in 2014. Uh, so the situation in Gaza is now a humanitarian crisis. So th the whole world, or big, big portions of it, certainly big powers, just step back and watch this, 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 this obvious uh, genocide uh, happen um, for 50 years. Uh, and why are they supporting Israel? That is a very long story and an interesting one, but for a variety of reasons, the European Union, and especially the United States, seem really invested in the settler colonial project called Israel. Uh, the history goes back well over a century with sure. Theodor Herzl and the Zionist movement, which really stems from 19th century European nationalism, the notion that there had to be a Jewish homeland, but not only a Jewish homeland, but one in historic Palestine. The British government actually offered other possibilities, Uganda, Western Australia, uh, but Herzl and others insisted on Palestine, which of course was um, occupied by Palestinians. Uh, Palestine at that time was a province of the Ottoman Empire. The British and the French carved up the Ottoman Empire at the end of World War I, and the British took Palestine which they ruled from the end of World War I until 1948 with the foundation of the State of Israel. So there's a very long and complicated history. It's complicated and yet quite simple, which is essentially that the indigenous people of Palestine have been dispossessed of their land, of their rights, and have uh, been restricted to what is now basically about 19% of historic Palestine, of what was the British mandate, and every day lose more land. Um, and lives. And uh, 
the U.S. has served basically as Israel's protector and has given Israel uh, impunity from accountability. Um, very crucially, I think, uh, in the United States, it's important to recognize that Zionism is not even a majority Jewish movement. The majority of Zionists are actually non-Jewish, especially Christian fundamentalists. And within the Jewish community, there's been a very distinct shift from uh, really unqualified support to is for Israel to a more critical engagement, especially with the younger generation of Jewish Americans. They've been very alienated by uh, the illegal occupation and especially the genocide in Gaza in 2014. So I guess what, what's, what's, what, what I'm what I'm thinking about is, is what does the, the powers that be or whatever powers that be in the United States and Europe get out of this? You know, what, I think the, the interesting question really is the opposite, which is what does Israel get from their support? Because if you look at it from an economic or even a strategic point of view, it would actually make more sense for the U.S. and EU member states uh, to support the Palestinian people from a strategic point of view. Um, it really is a case of the tail wagging the dog. I don't think it's that the U.S. gets much from it. In fact, if anything, I think Israel is a political liability in the Arab and Muslim worlds because of this illegal occupation and because of the oppression of the Palestinian people. So I think when we think about it, Israel doesn't have a lot of oil, right? So uh, what and the notion, which is, I think, popular in certain circles, that Israel is somehow a strategic asset for the U.S. and the Middle East, that's arguable. I think the reality is that it's a tail wagging the dog, and that it's Israel that benefits from U.S. protection um, as well as European support rather than the opposite. We, we, we were talking before earlier about when, when the... Um the community center, the, the gay and lesbian community center and transgender community center in, on 13th Street banned uh, Palestinians and some people spoke up and you were among the people that led the groups that changed that ban and, and that that was, that the Israel, the situation in Israel, between Israel and how they treat the Palestinians is one of the places where the progressive movement, the rubber meets the road and yes. the, what do you call them, peeps? Peeps. Uh, progressives on everything except for Palestine. As I like to say, peeps are not my peeps. Um, what happened, was, I was not involved with Palestine as an issue before February 2011. I had friends who were involved with a group called Siege Busters Working Group, and they were working to end the illegal Israeli blockade of the Gaza Strip, which has been going on for decades now. Um, they were planning an event called A Dance to End Israeli Apartheid and a very Islamophobic Zionist named, uh, uh, a, a very Islamic uh, uh, Zionist uh, got involved with uh, this Is this issue. this guy Lucas? Is yes, Michael Lucas, um, decided to, uh, was outraged by the fact that there was Palestine solidarity organizing going on in, um, in, at the center, and so wrote a letter to the executive director who promptly, at his behest, banned uh, Siege Busters Working Group and instituted a moratorium, a ban on Palestine solidarity organizing at the center, which is a total outrage. Uh, a friend and colleague of mine, Steve Alt, who is one of the original founding members of the original board of directors uh, that helped uh, establish the center, uh, was outraged by this, and a number of us decided to start this group, New York City Queers Against Israeli Apartheid, which was aimed partly at ending this ban, lifting this ban, and partly uh, at educating the community, the LGBT community, about Israeli occupation and apartheid. Um, after two years, in February uh, 2013, the center did lift uh, the ban. Uh, there's a very long story behind that. I tell the story in the only full-length account of this whole episode on my website, PaulingPark.com. You can find it there. It goes to over 30 pages uh, and goes into great deal, detail about this. But I think this is a perfect example of how the pinkwashing of the occupation, uh, the notion that Israel's supposedly superior record on LGBT issues somehow justifies this illegal occupation, um, is now becoming more and more central 
to the LGBT community. We see this time and again. We saw this uh, last month with the Chicago Dyke March, the attempt by this group called the Wider Bridge, which was founded specifically to pinkwash the occupation, how they disrupted uh, the Chicago Dyke March and hurled false accusations of anti-Semitism against the collective, which, by the way, included uh, Jewish members. This brings me to a question that we, we touched on briefly in our earlier conversation of, 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 of the LBGT community winning its rights, what, having, having been a little more successful, temporarily anyway, in winning its rights in, what, in two generations, three generations, which is really pretty fast. Um, compared to some other communities that, you know, can't get a handle on the vandal. Um, why do you think that is? Why? Well, you know, every um, social movement moves at a slightly different pace, and yet there are commonalities. Uh, the struggle for LGBT rights, while distinct from that of other communities, is also inextricably linked with mm -hmm. those. The struggle for women's rights, the rights of people of color. Of course, uh, many LGBT people are either women and or people of color. Um, we have not achieved complete and full rights. Right now, there are only 19 states in the District of Columbia that explicitly protect people from discrimination based on gender identity and expression, as well as sexual orientation. Uh, we don't actually have a statutory right uh, at the state level here in New York. We have an executive order, but we don't actually have a statute enacted by the state legislature that prohibits discrimination based on gender identity or expression. And we've seen backtracking with the Trump administration's uh, announced ban on openly transgender uh, service people yes. serving in the military and rescinding Barack Obama's um, executive order and guidelines with regard to transgender discrimination in schools. So I think the fight goes on. I do think that we have made tremendous progress, as you say, if you think about the Stonewall uh, riots in mm -hmm. 1969. Um, and here we are in 2017. And we've made enormous progress. Who in 1969 could have even envisioned um, same-sex marriage rights? And yet we now have marriage equality since the Windsor and Obergefell decisions. So we've made tremendous progress, but we have a long ways to go. And I think one of the things that we have to do as an LGBT community is think intersectionally about multiple oppressions. We have to think globally and internationally about how the LGBT community intersects with other communities and other struggles, one of these being Palestine, and uh, how it intersects with struggles such as struggle with regard to police accountability, police harassment and police brutality. Um, mm -hmm. For one, there's been a long history of that directed against LGBT people of color, especially transgendered people and especially queer uh, people of color. And so um, when we look intersectionally and broadly at all these struggles, we see connections, we see relationships, and that's what we really need to do. Look at these relationships. Uh, we have to look at the economics of this, the role that money plays, frankly, in all this, and um, how money and power relate, and how the struggle for empowerment is only partly about the struggle for juridical rights. It's really about not only laws, but it's about changing hearts and minds changing cultures and changing societies. So this, this going back to this, the, 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 the great uh, and, and long way to go uh, improvement that's happened in, in, in the rights community, because all, all of these fights seem to be, you know, smacks in the belly of the establishment uh, at the establishment, you know, reacting back. And among those smacks are the smacks about how money moves around, who makes a lot of money, who doesn't make a lot of money, and, and and the, the um, so I'm, I'm, I'm well, you, certainly African American people have made great strides. I mean, the, the world has changed dramatically in my lifetime. Uh, and I, I live in New York and I can, New York has changed. Yes. That, you know, although it, I, I heard recently it has the most segregated school system in the, in the United States. So it's changed and it's not changed. Yes. Yes. Um, 
So, so tell us something about the uh, the the Cuomo blacklist on this. Uh, um. So last summer, Andrew Cuomo issued an executive order, essentially banning support for or advocacy for boycott, divestment, and sanctions (BDS) aimed at apartheid Israel. Now. Uh, the governor's executive order actually kind of preempted legislation that was already moving forward. The state senate had already passed a bill, but the assembly had not yet acted. And that's partly because Cuomo wanted credit for this, wanted sole credit for doing this, since he's planning his presidential run. Um, this blacklist is really McCarthyite. And here I'm referencing Joe, not Eugene. Mm -hmm. um, the blacklist essentially would be a list of all organizations in the state that publicly support BDS aimed at dismantling Israeli occupation and apartheid. But what's particularly McCarthyite about this is that they won't necessarily tell you if your name is on the list. Um, and if your organization's name is on the list, you have to prove that you do not, that the organization does not support BDS for them to take it off. Now, this is clearly un unconstitutional. It's a total breach of the constitutional protections to freedom of speech. The U.S. Supreme Court has already ruled on the issue of boycotts. And in a case involving the NAACP, found that boycotts are a protected form of political speech. So it's unconstitutional. Um, the ACLU and NYCLU certainly believe that it's unconstitutional, and uh, Palestine Legal and other organizations. And a number of different organizations formed a coalition called the New York State Freedom to Boycott Coalition. We actually marched uh, from the Mount Kisco uh, MTA station, Metro North station, to uh, the governor's house um, in Mount Kisco. Uh, last uh, last July, uh, to protest this, um, there is an even more insidious piece of legislation, which is winning its way through Congress, which is called uh, the Israel Boycott Act, and it would criminalize support for BDS. Um, under its provisions, individuals could be sentenced to a 20-year prison sentence and up to a $1 million fine for publicly supporting BDS aimed at Israel. Now, this is clearly totally unconstitutional, um, but it's caused a certain flurry of activity. And Kirsten Gillibrand, the junior senator from the state of New York, just withdrew her support for the legislation. She had supported it before? Yes, she was one of the co-sponsors, and she considers she considers herself a progressive, yes. And Chuck Schumer, the senior senator from New York, is one of the co-sponsors. I might add that nearly half the sponsors are Democrats. So it's both Democrats and Republicans. Ben Cardin is a leading uh, uh, sponsor, the lead sponsor. He's a Democrat from Maryland. And it would criminalize public support for BDS. What's the goal of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, you know, aside from the obvious goal, <laughs> what's the uh, un less than obvious goal of, of number one, of, of, of criminalizing people for speaking, right. for supporting, it's, you know, is, is it just, it's, it's just gonna move it on into other areas? It's just the first area, and, and why is, is this, just an easy for some like Cuomo or Gillibrand, if they're running for re-election, they want to be, they want the support of those people, traditionalists, you know, in, in the Jewish camp, in the in the fundamentalist Christian camp, in the. I mean, I can't see any other reason for doing such a thing. Well, first of all, it's based on a false allegation of anti-Semitism against BDS. Uh, which is the false argument that somehow BDS singles out Jews as a class, which it doesn't. It's aimed at Israeli government policy, and a, a government policy that many Israeli Jews themselves actually object to. Mm -hmm. And there are Jewish organizations, including uh, Jewish Voice for Peace, and Jews Say No, a doll in New York, which is predominantly Jewish, and even New York City queers against Israeli apartheid, which is majority Jewish, uh, who oppose such legislation and who oppose Israeli occupation and apartheid. So it's based on a false allegation of anti-Semitism, and in fact, because it assumes that all Jewish Americans support 
uh, Israel unqualifiedly, in itself, it is implicitly anti-Semitic, actually, because, of course, many Jewish Americans oppose occupation and apartheid. Um, but it's, attempt, it's an attempt to chill speech and basically silence critics of Israeli occupation, apartheid, and genocide. Um, and uh, unfortunately, these, uh, these tactics often work. APAC, uh, the uh, America-Israel um, uh, Public uh, uh, Affairs Committee uh, based in Washington uh, has said that this uh, legislation is its primary uh, legislative uh, <laughs> goal uh, in uh, this year. And so uh, these tactics often do work. Uh, what's surprising to me, the only thing surprising to me is that Kirsten Gillibrand actually withdrew her support. This is the very first time that any member of Congress has actually withdrawn their support from pro-Israel legislation or anti-BDS legislation uh, that's been introduced into Congress. So that's the surprise. That's the surprise. But I think it's because there's such an outcry uh, in town hall meetings uh, from uh, her constituents, including uh, those who are members of Jewish Voice for Peace and other organizations, that and the fact that the ACLU told her directly, and they met with her and told her that the legislation was unconstitutional. Uh, it was an abridgment of uh, freedom of speech. And so to her credit, she did listen to them. Uh, I might add that she has, like so many other Democrats and Republicans, has a really terrible record when it comes to Israel-Palestine. She publicly uh, supported uh, the Israeli genocide in Gaza in 2014, as did Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. So we have a lot of work to do. But the fact that Kirsten Gillibrand with, would withdraw her support for this legislation is a very interesting development, I think. And it shows that those who, who support human rights for all in Israel-Palestine are actually making progress. It's, it, it seems to me like if, 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 if people were looking at this at like from 300 years from now or 400 years from now, the way that the, the population is dancing around these issues of racism and isms, you know, keeping one, you know, oh, oh, we, 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 we were good, we're not, you know, don't call us a racist or we, we support, we support uh, um, this group, uh, as, we're not paying attention to what they're doing to that group, but, we, you know, the, the, the clumsiness uh, the, of this, of this, this, these, these, these dances, where so much is not said, where so right. much is, you know, you don't mention, so, you know, it's anti-Semitic. No, it's not anti-Semitic, right. and you know that. You know that. I know you know that. You know I right. know you know that. Exactly. Uh, and but you, you refuse to, you, you refuse to cop to it. You just, you just put up the stupid, these stupid things, or, or, or the bathroom thing right. that, that's come out with it. Uh, there was a wonderful thing on thing. Facebook where somebody said, bathroom, we've been using your bathrooms forever. <laughs> you know, what are you talking about? Bathrooms, this is so, um, I know it's like, it's like, it's like little kids with very little knowledge are running the show. Right. Um, well, you have to understand that the bathroom panic, the transgender bathroom panic is the last gasp of the religious rights objection to LGBT rights. They lost the battle over same-sex marriage. And you know the smarter strategists and tacticians uh, in the Christian right know that they've lost that battle. There's never going to be a constitutional amendment uh, to prohibit same-sex marriage. It's simply not going to happen. The country's moved on. Um, there's been a sea change in terms of American public opinion on that issue, which has moved faster than on any other social issue in U.S. history. Uh, so they lost that. So what do they have left? They have the bathroom panic. Now, if you look at HB2 in North Carolina, it's important to recognize that that legislation wasn't just about uh, prohibiting transgendered people from using the public restroom um, consistent with their gender identity and presentation. It was really about rolling back civil rights and human rights for a whole bunch of people in that state because what that legislation did was it repealed all local city and county uh, civil rights and human rights legislation in the state. In other words, the ability to 
pursue a discrimination complaint based on race, ethnicity, religion, disability, sexual orientation, and gender identity. Ah, so that's what they were getting. Yes. They were getting a whole... So the agenda was much broader than just attacking transgendered people. It was about attacking women, people of color, people with disabilities, et cetera, et cetera. Open, uh, HIV, people who are living with HIV AIDS. And um, that's the untold story. Same thing in Texas now. There's a, there's a there's bathroom bill been introduced. What's important to recognize is that this legislation is not only unconstitutional, it's also unenforceable. It simply cannot work. And we could, if you're interested, I could go into details explaining why this legislation could never actually be enforced anyway. But uh, the broader agenda is rolling back civil rights and human rights, not only for transgendered people, LGBT people more generally, but for women and people of color and people with disabilities as well. I, I, that's certainly what it looks like. They, they, they've got their back up against the wall and, and they're gonna find ways to hold back the storm that's already there, you know, because yeah. it doesn't make any sense. What the, the, the Well, it's completely nonsensical. They're using a legitimate issue, which is the issue of women's safety, but manipulating it uh, to scare the public um, into seeing a danger where there is none. Actually, if anything, the people who are most vulnerable to assault in public restrooms are actually transgendered people. I'm sure. So uh, the legislation is totally misconceived. It's based on um, falsity and bigoted assumptions and prejudices. And as I say, the larger agenda is actually wrong back civil rights and human rights for everyone. <sighs> <laughs> Uh, we fight on. We fight on. We're 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 coming to the um, amazingly to the end of this discussion. We're going to have two discussions with with Pauline, uh, and so this is uh, we're we're twenty seconds away from the end of this. So uh, in the next time, we're going to be talking more, uh, even more about how money moves around, which is. Uh, something I really want to know more about. So thank you very much for Pauline for joining us on the facts and you know where we are everybody and good night.